Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this virtual meeting of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee. I'm Jim Roosevelt from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and along with my dear friend Lorraine Miller from the Republic, I mean the state of Texas, we serve as co-chairs of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Lorraine and I hope that you are all doing well and are staying safe and healthy. We look forward to the time when we can all meet together in person once again. We hope that'll be soon and we appreciate all that each of you does to make sure our party continues to function during these unprecedented times. As a reminder, this is an official meeting of the committee. So we are live streaming these proceedings on the DNC's YouTube channel so that we can have an official record of our deliberations and so that they're accessible to the public. Would you now all please join me in reciting <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, 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 God and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. For all. For all. Oh, Great. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. We are now about to call the roll because this meeting and our next meeting are focused on discussing the reforms of the 2020 presidential nominating process. Jim and I wanted to make sure that the RBC members who served this past cycle were included uh, in this important discussion. While some of our RBC members have gone on to other things and are no longer DNC members, we recognize that their insight is important and we appreciate their participation in these meetings. You know, you can remember from our previous meetings, we always had robust discussions before we actually got down to the business of uh, drafting the rules. I will now ask Patrice Taylor to call the role of RBC members who are participating in our call today. Committee, there will be no votes during this meeting, so we do not need to establish a quorum. Patrice? Uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, Mr. Berman? Ms. Blanco? Presente. Ms. Brazil? I see that she's on. Uh, Jeff's here, by the way. Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Mr. Brennan? Donna's here. Bless you. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Mr. Buckley. Here. Ms. Cardona. Presente. Um, Ms. Daughtry, um, I think she, I think she is having an issue, uh, so we'll reflect uh, if she is able to join. Um, Ms. Ms. Fowler? Yeah. Ms. Gerardo Rivers? Presente. Mr. Goodman? Here. Thank you. Ms. Higgins? Here. Mr. Ickes? Here. Ms. Kmart? Here. Mr. Leone? Here. And uh, thank you for allowing me to participate. Ms. Lewis? Here. Mr. Liu? 
Here. Ms. Martinez. Presente. Mr. McDonald. Here. Uh, Mr. Martin is uh, under the weather. I know he planned to be with us, but he's not going to be able to join us today. Um, Ms. Moore. Here. Ms. Mount. Here. Uh, Mr. Nutter. I saw, I see him on the line. Uh, Mr. Ray. Here. I'm sorry, I was on mute. I'm here. I'm sorry. It's okay. We got you. Ms. Ruiz. Mr. Saunders. Here. Hey, Lenny. Mr. Spate. Ms. Sullivan. I am here. Thank you. Ms. Swecker. know that she has a scheduling uh, and, and will be on and off. So we will reflect if she's able to join. Uh, Ms. Weingarten. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Zodi. Hello again, friends. Hi, Zodi. Well, great. Thank you, Patrice. Committee, in addition to the rules and bylaws committee members on the line, we are also joined by members of the staff, our DNC Council, Graham Wilson and Andy Levin, and our esteemed parliamentarian, Helen McFadden. They are here to help make sure our meeting runs smoothly. So thank you to the members on the call today. We appreciate you joining us uh, and the DNC staff for your hard work to ensure that we have this important discussion. And that's what it is, a, a discussion that we normally have um, as we um, prepare. Before we start discussing reforms, I wanna take a moment to address our successes. Last cycle, we defeated an incumbent president for the first time in nearly three decades. A record 81 million, let me say it again, 81 million Americans made their voices heard and cast their votes for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Their message was clear. They wanted new leadership in the White House. Now with over 100 days in office, this administration has accomplished so much. Shots in the arm with 50% of the adult population already fully vaccinated, checks in pockets for tens of millions of Americans, people back in jobs with more jobs created in the first 100 days than any other president in history and a renewed commitment to continue to build on this progress, to grow the economy, to end this pandemic once and for all. And we just didn't win the White House. We flipped control of the Senate after winning two Senate runoffs in Georgia of all places, where the odds were against us. We held control of the House, and we saw turnout increase across the board with more Democrats turning out to vote for Joe Biden more than ever before. To add an extra bit of emphasis, I'm going to call on Donna Brazil, our former chair, to give us a minute of highlights. Uh, Donna, if you would. DB, there you are. Sorry about that. I uh, Madam Chair, Co-Chair, and members of the committee, uh, we have some excellent news that I'm going to provide uh, to Patrice and the staff that shows just how incredible the turnout was, not only in the 2020 primary season, where we saw an incredible leap in Democratic performance and participation from 2008, 
2016 to 2020. We also saw an increase in support of millennials across the board. But the most impressive thing that we need to take a look at is just how uh, important our voter contact programs, our voting rights program, voter protection programs in terms of providing more access to the ballot. So I'm going to be submitting this report to the staff and we will make it available to everyone on the increase in turnout across the board, not just during the primary season, but also the general election. And hopefully Patrice will be able to share it with everyone so that we can add to this amount of data as well as uh, the new census information that will provide even more insights in terms of the demographic turnout, the statewide trends, and so so uh, and so much more. So with that, I'll turn back the balance of my time, and I will be providing <laughs> momentarily. Great, thank you, Donna. We appreciate you. Thank you. As Democrats committee, we have a lot to be proud of. While we should take time to celebrate that. We know we still have a lot of work to do. That's why the DNC, under the leadership of our great chair, Jamie Harrison, recently announced unprecedented investments in states well before the 2022 midterm elections. The investments will am amount to $20 million that will go to states this year alone to prepare for the midterm elections. These resources will fund critical infrastructure, including voter protection embeds, communication staff, and organizing programs in core communities. This will also create a vital foundation for us for 2024. So we are here today to make sure we build on our successes to make sure our party is in the best possible position to expand our majorities in 2022 and keep the White House in 2024. Now let's get to the business before us today. The main item of business at our meeting will be the discussion of reforms that were adopted by the DNC for the 2020 presidential nominating process, specifically, Today's meeting will focus on reforms related to government primaries and look at how those reforms provided expanded voter turnout. This will be the only item on our agenda today. After each presidential nominating cycle and before drafting the rules for the next process, the Rules and Bylaws Committee typically meets to review the elements of the last nominating process to determine what worked well and identify areas of changes that may be needed to improve the process going forward. For this cycle, the Rules and Bylaws Committee's discussion will focus on the major 2020 reforms in three key areas, primaries, caucuses, and automatic delegates. I wanna be clear that our conversation at today's meeting and our next Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting will not include the writing and implementation of rules for the next presidential nominating process. The next Rules and Bylaws Committee will be responsible for drafting and implementing the delegate selection rules for the 2024 cycle. As you know, from the very beginning of this review process, we have wanted to make sure our discussions incorporated the views of Democrats from across the country. So to do this, we developed a survey so that members of the public and key stakeholders like you and I were able to share our thoughts and ideas on what reforms work and what can be improved. So during today's meeting, we will share some of the feedback that we received so that the input we receive will be on record during our discussions. I'll turn it over to Jim 
who will go through the agenda and protocols for today's meeting. And I look forward to our robust, robust discussions. Jim? Oops, I'm muted. You're now, on. I, now I'm unmuted, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, to make sure that our meeting runs smoothly, I wanna go over the agenda and some quick protocols before we proceed. During our meeting, we will hear presentations from election administrators who will talk about state law and other administrative changes that helped to increase participation in state government run primaries. We will hear about efforts in the states to make the process to register to vote and affiliate with the party as simple and accessible as possible. The DNC's voter protection director will provide us with an overview of the party's efforts around voter protection issues, including highlights on how Democrats made voting more accessible and how the Republican party is working to roll those changes back. Finally, we will hear from a panel of state party chairs and rules and bylaws committee members who will discuss from the state party perspective, the positive experience of converting from a caucus, a party run event, in 2016 to a government run primary in 2020. As a reminder, rules and bylaws committee members and the guest speakers will automatically be muted throughout the meeting unless they are recognized to speak, at which point they will be introduced and unmuted by the staff. After the presentations, we will move to Q&A, <clears throat> which will be limited to rules and bylaws committee members only. If a Rules and Bylaws Committee member would like to be recognized for comments or questions, please use the raise your hand feature in the Zoom. Uh, uh, down, you go down to the uh, bottom panel and click on participants and you'll see the raise your hand uh, feature, I believe. The uh, uh, and if that is not correct, would someone from the technical staff correct me about that? That will help us with staff assistance to create a queue that we'll use to call on each member. When it is your turn to speak, you will be announced and unmuted. We will do our very best to call on everyone in the order that you seek recognition, but please be, be patient with us. Are there any questions? If there are questions, please submit your questions in the chat. Uh, Liz Maria Penn will uh, be following that and make sure that we address them for the group. Liz or Philip, uh, are there any questions? No questions as of yet. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, I think we move now to uh, introducing uh, our first uh, our first speaker and Lorraine, I'm sorry, I stepped on your line there. No, you didn't, <laughs> you could. So our first um, um, presenter today, we'll, we're gonna move into the section on primary reforms, changes that led to increase participation. So our first um, presenter today is the Arizona Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs. Excited to welcome our, our first guest speaker, Arizona Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs. As I hope you appreciate the job that secretaries of state do. It is they don't get a lot of PR, uh, but they do an essential part of the election process. We could not function without them. Secretary Hobbs has dedicated her professional life to public service and has worked extensively to ensure that Arizona elections are secure, that they're fair and efficient. Her efforts have led to increasing voter participation and education across the state. Please, RBC members, join me in welcoming 
Secretary Hobbs as she shares the primary reforms and changes that led to increased participation in Arizona during this last election cycle. Welcome to our meeting, Secretary Hobbs. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, thank you to the RBC for having me here today. Uh, good morning, if you're on my side of the country uh, or afternoon. And as you look forward to towards future elections, I'm really excited to have a chance to share with you some of the experiences that we had in Arizona last year and how we made voting safer and more accessible. And I want to start with saying that our preparation for the 2020 election started the moment I took office in 2019, uh, knowing that there were many disparities in voting across the state that we wanted to try to start addressing, removing as many barriers as possible. Obviously, I'm not saying anything that you don't all know. The pandemic really exacerbated those inequities and disparities, not just in voting, but across many different areas of, of, of life. And so addressing those disparities became that much more critical to us. Ultimately in Arizona, despite the unprecedented challenges we faced, not just with the pandemic, but with the widespread, really unprecedented misinformation directed at the elections, we saw record participation across three elections in 2020, which were some of the most successful elections we've held in modern history. So we we had to take action uh, to make voting safe and secure. Um, our presidential preference election was on March 17th, um, following uh, the day that many larger uh, jurisdictions shut down due to COVID. Uh, so we had to do really quick outreach to ensure that a lot of those government buildings that had already been secured as polling locations were going to still be available. Um, and then we had to quickly deploy supplies. And obviously this was happening along the way. We, we had early voting already going on a month before this. Um, one of the critical things, a lot of the polling places um, in rural areas, particularly the Navajo Nation, needed um, hand washing stations. We worked with government agencies to deploy those kind of things out there, which isn't a normal part of conducting elections. Uh, we, we worked really hard to ensure that um, sanitation and PPE supplies would be available so that voters and poll workers could be safe. And then that really set the stage for um, how we were going to prepare in the when we had a little more time for the for the uh, our August primary and the November general election and we worked with um, all of the county election officials as well as the governor's office to uh, to come up with the AZ vote safe plan um, utilizing the nine million dollars in CARES Act funding that was appropriated to Arizona. Uh, and, and, and really focusing on ensuring that no voter in Arizona had to choose between their health and safety and their freedom to vote. Um, we worked to, uh, we really worked to increase participation among uh, minority and underserved communities and those who are underrepresented in our elections um, for the most part, the, the places where we were already trying to address a lot of those barriers. We um, put together the, the state's first community-based voter outreach advisory council um, focused on increasing voter participation and engagement. And um, in addition to the $9 million in CARES Act money, we also invested close to $5 million of grant funding in voter education focused on combating the widespread disinformation. And we did that campaign in English, Spanish, and Diné. Um, and we put together um, several voting information guidebooks, um, both in, in all those languages um, and one part, uh, specifically targeted towards Native American voters, and then also guidance for long-term care facilities. We knew a lot of those voters were going to have issues. Um, sometimes those voters need extra assistance voting and with limited visitation wanted to make sure that those folks were able to exercise their right to vote as well. Um, we also entered into a landmark settlement with the Navajo Nation to allow tribal members to cure 
their ballots due to missing signatures up to five days after the election. Um, this this is a these are communities that are um, more that have a higher ballot rejection rate because of missing signatures. And so this cure um, period really allowed tribal members to make sure that their voices were heard in the election. Um, and that had significant impact on, um, you know, Arizona's outcomes. Finally, we made sure that Arizona was one of the easiest and most secure states to vote in. Uh, we, in addition to the already existing secure ballot drop boxes in the state, we deployed an additional 85 drop boxes to 13 of our 15 counties. The other counties um, uh, also secured additional drop boxes on their own. We made sure that every voter in Arizona who wasn't already on the permanent early voter list was mailed an application that was over 112,000 voters. Um, and also under my tenure, more than 500,000 additional voters were registered. And we saw a record breaking 3.4 million voters in the November 2020 election. Being a strong advocate for voter participation made all the difference in this election. We made record strides towards better elections here in Arizona. And, you know, we should really be celebrating the fact that we had this historic participation and instead we are in this place of having to defend those gains from our state legislature um, and from this uh, so-called audit that you've all, I'm sure, seen about happening here in Arizona that is really working to undermine the public's trust in our processes. Uh, my hope is that our experiences here in Arizona uh, is, is instructive uh, to you all, and, um, and I am very excited to answer your questions. Um, with all that you have going on there and your uh, ability to be um, uplifting about it and informative, we'll appreciate it. So um, we'll now open the floor for rules and bylaws committee members to uh, have any questions. And uh, guys, if you raise your hand or put a question in the chat for Secretary Hobbs, so RBC members remember that if you would like to be recognized for comments or questions, please use the raise your hand feature in the Zoom um, that will help us and that will assist the staff in creating a queue uh, so that when uh, it's your turn to speak, you will be announced. We will do our level best to call on everyone in the order that you seek recognition. While the staff compiles the list of RBC members who would like to be called on, I'd like to share one of the comments we received from the survey. I hope everybody on this call filled out the survey. I mean, how can we not know what you're thinking and what you saw that went well, that didn't go so well without your sharing that information with us? So let's. Let's go to uh, one of the comments that we saw in the survey was from Cheryl from Massachusetts, Jim. She says, quote, the extension of voting rights, more opportunities to register to vote, and all the other re efforts made to include all people in the voting process was successful and an imperative for future elections. I think that's true. So, Philip, do we have any RBC members that have questions for Secretary Hobbs? Thank you, Chairwoman. We do. Uh, we will go to uh, Harold Ickes uh, with the first question. Our staff will unmute your microphone and feel free to speak. Hi, Harold. Hi. Do you unmute or I unmute? You're unmuted. I'm sorry. Yeah, go here. Am I, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It was a terrific presentation. Two questions. Um, 
how much state legislation did you require in order to do what you did or was much of it by way of rules and regulations? And number two is, I'm really interested in the, your description of uh, permitting Navajo, members of the Navajo Nation to obtain signature verification five years, at, five years, five days after the, uh, after the actual ballots were cast. And could you explain a little bit how that worked? Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much for that question. Um, please let's not let this election go on for five more years. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's already gone on long enough. Um, so, so thankfully, we did not need any legislation to implement the, the things that we did for this election because it was very clear from early on that our legislature was not interested in making it easier for Arizonans to vote. So I was very thankful that we have long had uh, no excuse absentee voting in Arizona. It's been in place for decades. And along with that, uh, the permanent early voter list, which is basically the next best thing to having universal vote by mail. Anyone who wants to, any voter can sign up for that and they receive every ballot that they're eligible to vote for in the mail. And so we wanted to make sure that every Arizona voter who wasn't already there knew that they could be. Um, and so we sent those out applications. Um, and the, the ballot curing issue has been a long, uh, an ongoing um, sort of battle here in the state. Uh, in our, in statute, if your signature is mismatched, you have the opportunity to cure that for five days after the election. But if your signature is missing, that cure period stops at, at 7 p.m. on election day when the polls close. And so all those folks who are dropping off their early ballots on election day, mm -hmm. they don't have the opportunity to cure. And the, the, it disproportionately impacts Native communities because the instructions on the ballot envelope are not in Diné. And, um, and so they, they're, 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 they're not getting the instructions in their native language and there's a barrier there. And so, um, so we treat those voters differently if they're mismatched signature versus a, a missing signature. And so that settlement, and, and it actually was not, it was for all voters, um, we can't, you know, treat different voters differently. So, um, but it really um, impacted the, the Native American communities um, in a, in a more positive, in a, it was more important for those communities. And so that settlement was only for the 2020 election and moving forward, it has now been enshrined in statute that the cure period ends at 7 p.m. on election day for missing signatures. And so that progress that we made has now been um, uh, uh, repealed and, and that law was signed into law by the governor um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so that was one thing. And then, um, oh, that was your question. Yes, I think that's all of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next up, uh, we have Frank Leone. Um, feel free, uh, we will unmute your microphone and feel free to ask your question, Frank. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary, for everything. You're, you're, you're just a hero in, 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 the, in the voter protection mm -hmm. world. You've done a wonderful job before the election, and, and so sorry you have to deal with all the nonsense that you have to deal with now in the audit. We are, we are following, it, yeah. um, following it closely. In general, is there something that can be done to restore voter confidence in the system? The other side has been so busy you know, telling all these lies and then saying they need more investigation to clear up the lies that they've raised. I mean, I think voters don't realize, you know, machines are certified. There's logic and accuracy testing. There's risk limiting audits. I mean, it's not just a, a black box. Um, uh, is there something that we can do to, to educate voters so they really understand that this is, it's not a perfect process, but it's a very good and fair and secure process? Um, yeah, that's a great question and certainly a discussion that we've been having as secretaries of state across the country for the last several months, even before the election, because the misinformation was out there before. And that's why the, um, the close to $5 million investment that we made in public education was so critical, because we not only 
um, informed voters of their options and how to vote safely, especially in the pandemic, but also wanted to make sure we were being as transparent as possible and providing information about all the things we do to secure our elections. Um, and we, um, put, we, we put together a really comprehensive information page, Arizona.vote, if you're interested in looking at it, an example of all the information that we put together for this election. And we continued to put out information after the election. So we included a rumor control uh, aspect to that site to try to refute right away the misinformation that was out there and all of the conspiracy theories. Um, and so that's one piece of it. Uh, and the other thing is that we had engaged across the country with secretaries of state, um, a widespread trusted info campaign, making sure that people are getting their election information from the right sources, because even well-intentioned people can accidentally put out information that's not entirely accurate. And so that trusted sources pointing people to the to election officials for their election information was critical. We're going to continue to do that. And the bottom line is that all of these people that are out there spreading this misinformation, they, are, they, they either know that they're making it up and they don't care, or they just, they don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. And so we have to continue to tell the truth. And that's why we left the Arizona vote page, Arizona.vote is still standing so that people have a resource to go to, to get the truth, to tell it. Um, and frankly, there are many leaders on the other side who have been too remiss in standing up and telling the truth as well. They know that our our election was secure. They know that it was accurate. They know mm -hmm. that Joe Biden won in Arizona and mm -hmm. that Joe Biden is the legitimate president. And they are not willing to stand up and say that because of the political consequences. And, you know, we need leaders in our country that are going to stand up and do that. I, I can't control that, but that is my it's a wish I have, and I don't know that it's ever going to be fulfilled. Um, but, but you know, there are Republican leaders in our state who basically left me hanging out to dry, knowing that our election was fair and secure, and um, they're not willing to stand up and say that. And our governor was at the RGA yesterday and had an interview with um, Sean Hannity. I don't know if any of you saw that. And um, he said that Trump is the leader of the party, and he said that, um, well, let's just see how this fourth audit, which isn't even a real audit, he won't even say it's not a real audit, plays out. And those are things that continue to undermine uh, the election integrity, even if they're not outright saying that there was fraud, you know, so it's very unfortunate that we're at this place. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have time for one more uh, question and we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Artie Blanco. Uh, feel free uh, to ask your question uh, once your mic is unmuted. Great, thank you. And Secretary of State um, Hobbs, so great to see you and, and have you join us. I wanted to ask about the permanent early vote list. There was a new bill that was passed and the governor signed it immediately when it got to his desk. Can you let us know a little bit more about how this would affect um, that list. Yeah, and I think I always preface this question with reminding folks that our uh, our no excuse absentee voting um, legislation, as well as um, adding the permanent early vote list, were both done w in a Republican majority legislature, and they have enjoyed widespread uh, participation. Seventy five percent of voters in Arizona are on the permanent early voter list, and it is the bulk of county recorders' jobs are maintaining and keeping the voter lists accurate, including the permanent early voter list. And there was no problem that needed to be fixed. Um, Michelle Eugenti Rita, who's the Senator who, um, who, who passed this bill, she's introduced this bill for 10 years. I voted no on it eight times when I served with her in the state legislature. It's clearly an unpopular idea. By the way, she just announced that she's running for secretary of state yesterday. Wow. Um, so, wow. So what was different about the bill this year is that all of these legislators who have tried to suppress votes for years have used the big lie as an excuse to justify this terrible legislation. And so at the end of the day, the impact that this bill will have is to purge hundreds of thousands of voters in Arizona off the permanent early voter list. Again, trying to fix a problem that does not exist. 
um, the, the, the criteria for being purged is that the person, uh, the voter, if they don't use their mail-in ballot for four consecutive elections, then they're, then they're purged. But I want to make it clear because there's been people saying in the national media that, oh, if they don't participate and make, and it, and it sounds like if they don't vote, but it's not just if they don't vote, it's if they choose to vote in a method other than their early ballot, which has always been an option in Arizona. If you decide to vote early in person because you don't want to wait for your mail-in ballot, which happened a lot in this last election, people were excited to vote or afraid that something would happen and they wouldn't be able to, and they went to early voting on the first day it was open, there's a feature where your mail-in ballot is canceled and you vote in person, and that's the, the, the way the system works to make sure people don't vote twice, and that would be something that would land somebody on the purge list if they voted, but they just didn't vote with their mail-in ballot. And so it's it's a horrible bill and it's designed to make it harder for people to vote. Um, and uh, we are gonna try, we have some time to work against this. It It's not retroactive, so it's moving forward. So the next four uh, primary and general elections in 22 and 24 is when it will start to be implemented. But um, so we do have some time to hopefully reverse this terrible law in Arizona. Thank you. Well, how many more do we have left in the queue for Secretary Hobbs? Sherman, looks like we are getting uh, just one more question um, if we have time um, from uh, former uh, Chairman uh, Donna Brazil. Um, she wanted to ask on the impact of Shelby v. Holder um, on on her state. Um, so if if we do have time for that one question, um, feel free to... Let's, let's do it, if we can do it quickly. All right, great. Sure, well, I'm, I'm concerned because Arizona was subject to pre-clearance and right now we're going through our first round of redistricting without that provision. And, um, you know, the fact that we had pre-clearance in the past has been remarkably helpful in getting more mm -hmm. competitive legislative districts. We do have an independent redistricting com commission, so it's less politicized uh, than you know other states that the legislature draws the districts. But it's still the maps are always ending up in court, and that preclearance provision um, helped a little bit with that. So I'm um, really uh, not super optimistic going into this round of redistricting in terms of the impact that we'll have. But then also, obviously, all of these voter laws that we're seeing passed, uh, those would have been subject to preclearance as well. And they no longer are, which is partly why, um, you know, they're they're working to get them passed now uh, when they wouldn't have passed. They, they might have passed earlier, but wouldn't have passed muster with preclearance. So. Great. Secretary Hobbs, thank you. <laughs> One last, this is yes or no. You mentioned that secretaries of state are, you've been discussing this as an organization. This is a bipartisan discussion or is it just partisan, just Democrats? Well, our Republican colleagues, for the most part, don't want to be a part of this discussion. They want to bury their heads in the sand and pretend nothing happened. Um, and, you know, Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, yeah. he's, um, you know, he's been under attack. And so now he's embracing this sort of Arizona style audit that's coming to Georgia. Um, but there are, so Kim Wyman in Washington, Barbara Sagafsky, um, she's also been attacked by her party in Nevada. Um, those folks are with us, but most of the Republicans don't want to have the discussion. I'm about to head into uh, uh, our weekly meeting today where we're going to talk about um, some sort of resolution or statement about best practices for post-election audits. And I'm really not looking forward because it's going to be a pretty fraught with um, the partisan rancor. So. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. You've opened, you've uh, illuminated, opened up uh, the real the reality that we're having to deal with. Um, as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And come again. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. Jim?
Thanks, Lorraine, and thank you, Secretary Benson, for a fascinating presentation. We will now hear from our next guest speaker, Michigan Secretary of State. Uh, uh, there, thank you, Secretary Hobbs, for a fascinating presentation. And we'll now hear from our, our next guest speaker, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Secretary Benson has been a fierce advocate for voting rights and continues to ensure secure and accessible elections in Michigan. She will share the administrative and legislative changes that were made in her state and how they help to make voting more accessible. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Benson. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, really important discussion because I think, and I know many of you agree and know firsthand how there's really no issue that is more important for us at this moment than the attacks against our democracy because we know if those attacks succeed, it impedes our ability to see progress on any issue from gun violence to access to health care to improving uh, the health of our communities all across the country. So thank you for giving both Secretary Hobbs and I some time with you today to talk about the very real war on democracy that began really, we saw the beginning of in 2020 in terms of the lengths through which people are going to go to undermine our processes. But make no mistake about it, the election of 2020 is behind us, but this battle over the future of our democracy is escalating. And it's escalating in states all across the country, in state legislatures all across the country, and in efforts all across the country to remove the authority of election administrators and place them in the hands of Republican partisan operatives so that when 2024 comes around, decisions are made right now and people are being put in place right now and rules are being discussed right now so that in 2024, all those folks who tried to undermine the count, stop the count, undermine democracy, even to, to the escalation of the attack on our US Capitol on January 6, all of those forces are gonna be back in 24. And they're going to be better funded, more organized, more strategic, and in more places of authority than they were in 2020. And we can prepare for that now by similarly ensuring the tactics that we employed in 2020, which were simply ensuring everyone could vote and that vote was protected, that those continue so that in 2024, we are ready, we're prepared, and we prevail again in ensuring that democracy rules. Um, but make no mistake, this is a, a long-term commitment. This is work that we must all prioritize between now and 2024. So that's why I'm so grateful for you to prioritizing this right now in May of 2021. Uh, I'll start just by saying in, in Michigan in 2020, we actually had, as in Arizona, an enormous success in our election. We saw more people vote than ever before in every single election that we had. We had four elections in Michigan in 2020, including the presidential primary in March of 2020. And that election was the first election, the first statewide election, the presidential primary, where citizens for the first time had a right to vote from home, had a right to be registered to vote up to and on election day, and had a right to be automatically registered when they get a state ID. All of those new rights were imp Im uh, imparted in our state by citizens, by an initiative effort in 2018, where citizens amended our state constitution, voted overwhelmingly, 70% to do so, to create these types of options for people to vote and be registered. So what that did in 2018, leading into 2020, was prepare us to say, this is a mandate from voters. They want easy access to the vote. They want to be able to register to vote in convenient ways. And my job as Secretary of State was simply to implement all of those things. Uh, I'll just say as an aside, it's notable that a lot of those same things are in the For the People Act, which is really underscores why it's so important and doable for us to implement those changes nationwide. But in 2020, we saw enormous success, both through implementing those changes that we were able to do quite quickly within a cycle. Uh, and then we saw voters embrace them in record numbers. I mentioned every election we saw in 2020 uh, had record breaking turnout. Even in a local election in May, two months into the pandemic, we broke turnout records for local elections where 25% of residents participated two months into the pandemic because they had the option to vote absentee. Uh, and then, uh, as many of you know, shortly after that, in the uh, summer, about a year ago now, of 2020, I mailed absentee ballot request forms to every single registered voter in the state, as, long as, as well as my colleagues in many other states, Democrats and Republicans. We did that because we knew the most direct way to inform voters about how to vote from home, which they wanted to do in the midst of a pandemic, was to send them a request form so that they could, from the comfort of their own 
own home, request a ballot be mailed to them. So we did that, and that really set the stage for voters to embrace the ability to vote absentee. In our August primary, which where there was no statewide contested election, no major election on the ballot, we still saw 2.5 million people vote, more than had even voted in any August primary before, including when there had been contested gubernatorial elections on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so we saw directly what a lot of us already know, that when you make voting more convenient, more people participate. And that, of course, led to November 2020, where we saw 5.5 million citizens vote. Our turnout exceeded 71%. It was the largest turnout in the history of our state in terms of numbers and percentage. 3.3 million of those citizens voted absentee. Uh, 30,000 citizens registered and voted on election day itself, which underscores, which we saw in every election, how particularly young people, 18 and 19 years old, really take advantage and embrace the chance to register to vote at the last minute, for lack of better words, and vote on election day. And I think of it as those are 30,000 people who otherwise were eligible to vote but wouldn't have been able to without that protection in place for election day registration. Uh, and then, of course, we saw um, in the counting of the ballots, the tabulation of all these ballots, we were prepared. And I can answer questions about what we did to prepare for it, but we were prepared to efficiently tabulate absentee ballots, even despite the fact that our state legislature didn't give us additional uh, time to do so. And we were able to report the results of our election 24 hours after the polls closed in Michigan. Now, after that, we were really, um, all of us, shocked at the way in which the attacks and the misinformation that we'd been battling throughout the election cycle in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, people, including the former president, trying to confuse people about their options to vote, make them scared about voting, all these things that we knew were sent to uh, ca cause chaos and confusion and depress voter engagement. Those, of course, those efforts escalated after the polls closed, after the results were in. Uh, and that's the moment we've been living in ever since, trying to continue to remind people what the facts and the truth are against those seeking to deny the reality of the 2020 election. Now, as I mentioned, the election is behind us, but the, the tactics that we saw employed in 2020 to try to undermine our success, undermine democracy, block people from voting are now escalating. We see this in three battlefronts. One, uh, we see a continuation of the big lie through fake quote unquote frauds, as Secretary Hobbs talked about, which are really just efforts to keep in the mindset of many people in this country, this question alive over whether or not the election was secure and safe and accurate. We know it was, but in an effort to keep feeding that misinformation, we're seeing these forensic audits pop up around the country, which aren't actually audits at all. In fact, in Michigan, we've conducted over 250 audits since the November election. Every single one of them just affirmed that the election was secure and the results were accurate. Yet that hasn't stopped uh, bad actors from trying to call for more audits and continue to try to get their hands on ballots, machines, and even voter data in order to just further misinformation and the big lie. So that's tactic number one. Tactic number two is change the rules. We see this all across the country. People trying to change the rules in state legislatures to undo the policies, ultimately, that made 2020 such a high turnout election. And there's 39 bills percolating through the state legislature in Michigan right now that are all designed to make it harder to vote under the guise of reducing uh, or addressing fraud. But of course, none of the bills are actually a response to any type of election fraud. They're a response to increased voter turnout. And that's what we have to, to frame them as. Uh, we also know, and I'm happy to go into more details, that there is a path through the law that even if the governor, as we know she will, vetoes all these voter suppression bills, there is a path through collecting signatures of just 4% of our voting age population, in which the Republican-led state legislature can use those signatures to justify overriding the governor's veto. There's a lot of other tactics at play right now, but they all get back to trying to change the rules to make it harder for people to vote, not just in 22, but ultimately in 24. And the last tactic is changing the authority of election administrators or changing the administrators themselves so that they've got more folks in place who can make bad decisions uh, about denying democracy in 2024 and beyond. We see that in contested Secretary of State races across the country, in Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, and Nevada in particular, that are all up in 22. But we also see that in efforts to strip Secretary Hobbs, Secretary Raffensperger, myself, of our ability to do our jobs, of our authority to protect the vote, and uh, to, uh, in doing so, transfer that authority to more partisan actors. And that third tactic is the 
of the most pernicious of the three, even though they're all terrible. Because when you look at why democracy prevailed in 2020, it was because good people did the right thing. It's because good people make good decisions on both sides of the aisle to protect the vote and uphold the law, as opposed to cave to partisan pressure. If those good people, or if good people aren't in place to do that again in 24, we could see a successful effort to overturn an election, or at the very least interfere with the vote counting process to cause confusion, chaos, and doubt in real time about the election results. That's where we're headed. That's the strategy, that's the plan. And so we need good people, we need voter protections in place, and we need to stop, to start to stop the spread of the big lie by continuing to demand the truth in order to overcome all of this. I think I'll just close by emphasizing that none of us can take the, the, our eye off the ball right now. None of us can deprioritize these issues because that's what they're hoping we do. They're hoping that we focus on a lot of the other things that we need to focus on and continue on terms of issues to push forward on, but we can't um, allow an inch of space for those who are who are strategizing every day to try to undo our democracy for years to come and really leading towards a battle in 24 that is going to be a significantly more intense battle than we endured in 2020. Uh, that's what we need to be preparing for as well. And uh, I'll just say, finally, we can't let go of our optimism and hope in this moment either, because at the end of the day, the truth is on our side. The history is on our side. Every time we have stood up to protect the vote as citizens in this country, we have prevailed. But we have to stand up, stay vigilant, speak the truth, invest in secretary of state races across the country and election administrator races to make sure that good people are in place in 24 and beyond and not take our eye off the ball and stay vigilant against any and all attacks to undo our democracy because we are in a historic moment where we're at the precipice of potentially dismantling the foundations of our government. There are people who are well-organized, strategic, and well-funded who want to do that to maintain power, to push through an agenda that the majority of people in America don't want. That's what's at stake. And as long as we keep speaking that truth, we can move forward victoriously and win because the people are on our side, as you all know, but we've got to do that. We've got to take it seriously, as you all know, in the months ahead, um, because, um, because the, the, the moves that we make now and the decisions that we take and the investments we make now will ultimately determine our success in 24 and beyond. So thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Benson. Thank you very much, Secretary Benson. Uh, and uh, now we will open the floor to RBC members who have questions for Secretary Benson or other questions and comments. If any Rules and Bylaws Committee member would like to be recognized for comments or questions, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. That will help us with the assistance of our staff, create a queue that we'll use to call on each member. When it's your turn to speak, you will be announced and unmuted. We will continue to do our best to call on everyone in the order that you seek recognition. While we uh, compile a list of RBC members who would like to be called on, I'm going to share another one of the comments we received in our online survey. Uh, this one is once again from Massachusetts, uh, from Joel, uh, who said, I think these reforms were positive overall and they should continue to be encouraged. We should find ways to help states where Democrats have trifectas of governance to adopt laws to make voting easier. No voter should have to wait in line nor face the wrath of county or state election officials defunding or moving polling locations. Philip, uh, do we have any, uh, any questions in the queue? Thank you, Chairman. I think we have time for just uh, one uh, question here. Um, Jeff Berman, uh, feel free to uh, ask your question once our staff unmutes you. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, super. Uh, thanks, uh, Secretary, for that presentation. Very, very good. Very interesting uh, and sobering also, of course. Um, but I have a, a question having to do with the rules. I, I, I noticed that uh, in Michigan, you, you do not register by party and you have same day voter registration. And around the country, it's really kind of a patchwork of rules on those questions as to who permits registration by party and, and where there might or might not be 
uh, same day voter registration, including some very large states that uh, do permit same day registration as, as does I, Michigan, right? So I was wondering if you could just give us a sense uh, from your perspective, what same day voter registration provides to the voters and whether it's uh, a difficult thing for you to uh, implement or whether those states that don't have same day registration uh, might, might be something they could look at as we look at trying to expand the range of voters who can participate in our process. Um, including in, in the states that do have registration by party, which which I know you don't. But if you could talk for a minute about that. And did voter, uh, did same day registration come about uh, as a result of this 2018 initiative or, or does it predate that? It did come about as a result of the 2018 initiative, embraced by voters on both sides of the aisle. We saw people take advantage of it, as I mentioned. Uh, we've implemented it quite smoothly and successfully. The, the system that we use is you have to, Register. You can register and vote on election day, but you can't do it at a precinct. You have to do it at your clerk's office, which originally we felt might be an issue, but it's actually ended up to create a great system as long as you educate voters about where to go to register and then vote. Uh, it works quite well. We had very little, if any, issues of voters showing up at precincts and being redirected. Uh, and, um, and all of them just simply went to the clerk's offices and we set up an infrastructure and education model for that. The biggest takeaway we saw is that the vast majority of citizens who registered and voted on election day were under the age of 30. And by vast majority, I'm talking 80, 90%. In fact, the first time we allowed, or we had same day voter registration in Michigan was a local election in May of 2019. 400 individuals across the state in very small elections registered in and voted on election day. 330 of them, of the 400, were 18 and 19 years old. And we saw that same ratio as the number increased also increase as well. So I think in what, what we've seen in every election, and there now has been several, you know, almost seven or eight with same day voter registration is that it's it's a smooth, secure thing to do. All the best practices, it, it, you know, the data is out there on how to implement it successfully, smoothly, securely. And the most demonstrable impact it has is in engaging young voters on both sides of the aisle in voting and participating for the first time, which is a great way to invest in the future of our democracy. Philip, did we also have a question from Elaine Kmark? Uh, we did, if, if time permits, uh, yeah, feel free. Like an extra five or six minutes or so. Oh, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. Uh, our staff will uh, unmute you, uh, Elaine, and feel free to ask your question. Yeah, hi, Secretary Benson. I, I wanted to um, also meet you personally and thank you for writing for Brookings a year ago. You wrote a very nice uh, piece for us about your plans for the election day, and it looks like you actually got to do most of your plans for election day. So uh, thank you for that piece. It was uh, been exactly a year. I, I had a question about uh, processing ballots. Um, are are you, first of all, were you able to process ballots before the end of election day? You were not. That um, you, We could begin at 7 a.m. on election day processing absentee okay. ballots, not prior. Not prior. Are you try are you trying to change that? And is there resistance to that in the legislature? Yes and yes. They pretty okay. much yes. 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 And you'd like to change it to what? A day Allow or two? a week, a week of pre-processing. That's the national best yeah. practice as the um as many yeah. of the, the you know, seven right. days. Right, many other states do that. Is we, yeah, is what we've asked for for about two and, years now. And in those 39 bills, I take it there's efforts to restrict that or keep it the same. Yeah, remarkably, that one thing we've asked for did not show up in any of the 39 bills, but there is one bill that yeah. some senators have actually put out mailings bragging about saying um, that the count needs to stop at noon the day after election day and results reported at that time, which in particularly would, would mean in our most populous communities, Detroit, Flint, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, where counting sometimes isn't done by noon the day after mm -hmm. election day, right. that uh, the count would have to stop and you, you know, it, it could lead to ballots being yeah. mapped. Um, so that's that's the direction. That's fan. Okay, that's the direction you're going. All right, well. Uh, that's the direction the, others are going. I don't see uh, that. Uh, right, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, good luck. <laughs> good luck. But again, nice, nice to actually meet you in person. <laughs> Likewise. All right, Philip, I think we're out of time now. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, I, again, I want to thank Secretary Benson for uh, 
a, a very, very interesting presentation. Very helpful to us as we uh, look at the performance in uh, 2020. And now I'm gonna turn it back to my co-chair, uh, Lorraine Miller. Lorraine, uh, are you on? Okay, uh, let me pick up. Uh, I think Lorraine may be having a connection problem. So uh, next we will hear from our fellow Rules and Bylaws Committee member, uh, Yvette Lewis. Yvette is also chair of the Maryland Democratic Party, as you know, uh, an opera singer by training, and I have had the pleasure of hearing her sing. Uh, she is also an organizer, political activist, and an advocate to increase participation and engage voters across the country. In addition, Yvette has, tapped, uh, has been tapped to chair the Association of State Democratic Chairs Voter Protection Task Force. In this role, she will work with state parties and the DNC's voter protection team to organize and collaborate on voter protection issues. Yvette, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us uh, today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here with all of you. Um, this is, uh, has been an exciting time um, here uh, for us in Maryland. We learned a lot um, this last election cycle, both in Maryland and nationwide. We're fortunate to be a deep blue state. President Biden won over 65% of the vote, but in the past, low democratic turnout has allowed Republicans to win state and local offices here in Maryland. In 2020, we were determined to not repeat the mistakes of the past and ensure uh, an historic democratic voter turnout that would elect President Biden and reelect our seven democratic members of Congress. Fortunately, we exceeded even our own ambitious goals, achieving over 76% Democratic turnout and almost 5% increase over 2016. There are a few key reasons for this uh, historic turnout. So I wanna share some of the successes and uh, hope that we can all continue to learn here in Maryland and nationwide based on what we did. This was years in the making. After our election in 2014, where low turnout, especially in communities of color, flipped the election to Republicans, we realized we needed to not only increase our numbers, but we needed to make it easier to vote in Maryland. Our Democratic legislature passed laws to allow same-day registration in 2016 and to automatically register eligible, eligible voters in 2018. Since the passing of these laws, we have seen our voter participation and democratic registration numbers steadily grow. This was further spurred by the former president's actions, such as his despicable Bible stunt the day before our primary, which we really think contributed to the huge turnout in our democratic primary, especially among young people. We've also made sure to improve our voter registration and voter access efforts in communities and groups that have traditionally been marginalized or have not had equal access to the ballot box. In 2016, our Democrats passed a law so felons could register to vote as soon as they were out of prison. In 2020, everyone in the Maryland prison system who was eligible to vote received a postage prepaid ballot. Maryland Democrats in our legislature specifically passed legislation to put ballot drop boxes in communities who have historically not had equal access to ballot boxes. This year, building on these successes, Democrats permanently protected our state's vote by mail program and enshrined ballot drop boxes into law. But it's not enough to just register more voters and make it easier to vote though. We need to turn out those Democratic voters and educate them on how easy voting is. These were our two top priorities going into 2020. First, in the presidential primary, every single registered Democratic voter was mailed a ballot. It was secure, easy, and it allowed for an historic turnout, but it still took significant education. Ballots had to be filled out in a very specific manner that wasn't necessarily intuitive. 
In the weeks leading up to the primary, we focused our efforts on educating voters on how to fill out these ballots and just how easy it really was for them to vote. In the general election, our governor changed this. Instead of mailing only ballots, instead of mailing ballots, he sent out applications, a move specifically meant to confuse voters. And in some cases it did. To counter this, we redoubled our efforts, not just on voter persuasion and voter turnout calls, but on voter education. We reached out to likely Democratic voters, ensuring that they had the information that they needed to vote. We also ran digital ads that targeted voters who may not vote if they believe there were additional barriers. We provided them with information they needed to fill out the ballots. Similarly, we ran radio ads on Baltimore City's largest Black radio station, advertising I will vote. Finally, we concentrated all of our media efforts on educating voters. Our surrogates hit the TV and radio channels to do dozens of voter education interviews. We also trained local Democratic clubs and candidates and committees on the new balloting process, ensuring that Democrats across the state were able to get the help they needed to vote from their local leaders and sources. Still, this did not address every Democratic voter. We knew there would be those that still had issues. So we set up and staffed a voter protection and information hotline. Voters with questions about their registration status or questions on how to vote could call the hotline and get the help they needed. This was also used to report incidents of voter suppression or voting rights infringements. As I'm sure every state party does, we worked extensively to turn out our Democratic voters, both in rural areas that have trended away from Democrats and in or urban areas that have been more favorable to Democrats. We worked with local candidates to specifically target neighborhoods and regions they believed had room for Democratic growth and ran the most robust detailed data campaign our state had ever seen. Because of this, we flipped three more rural counties from red to blue. That investment really paid off. These efforts were just the beginning in 22, beginning and in 2022, we're definitely going to double down because we know we are facing a challenging midterm cycle and we have a gubernatorial election here in Maryland. Our goal is to learn and build on these successes to see what didn't work and try to improve those things that didn't work so that we can maintain our historic voter turnout across Maryland and the nation. So now we feel it's the time to act. We are going to do all that we can to make sure that we continue to be as responsive as we possibly can to our voters, keeping the lines of communication open. I will tell you that here I have even formed a rural council where we will be specifically focusing on the rural communities. Um, we're very excited uh, about the people that have volunteered to be a part of this. And this is something that we're doing now um, and not waiting until next year, making sure that we start these conversations and these communications as soon as possible so that when it's time to get out there and knock on doors and get people to phone bank, people won't say, where has the Maryland Democratic Party been? I will tell you all of these activities that, that um, I mentioned, I personally was involved in. I spent several weekends with different constituency groups phone banking. I have made a pledge to canvas in each one of my counties um, in this next election, to, in each, this election, next election cycle. And I intend to keep that pledge because I can't ask people to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So this will be a very robust, uh, uh, interactive, participatory type of experience for all of us, staff included, uh, to make sure that we have the voter turnout that we need to take back the governor's mansion, make sure we keep our uh, federal elected officials and our state and local elected officials in office. But the most important thing for us is education, conversation, engagement. And that way we think we'll be victorious. So that's my report. Thank you very much, uh, Yvette. That was great. Uh, uh, are there uh, questions for Yvette? No, not uh, as of yet, but I do want to point out uh, that Secretary Benson did uh, mention that any additional questions uh, can be uh, forwarded to her. And we did have one question that wanted to be forwarded uh, from former chair uh, Brazil, um, and it has to do with uh, cybersecurity and what preparations uh, 
they had to go through to ensure uh, their election system was protected. Um, so that'll be forwarded over to um, the secretary um, and the floor is still open uh, for questions. Okay, I think everybody knows if they have questions right now, they should use the raise your hand feature uh, in Zoom. Uh, the, uh, I am gonna read a comment from John, this time from California, not from Massachusetts. Uh, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. We are a country. <laughs> right. Uh, I had nothing to do with that, Lorraine. But at any rate, the uh, John says, uh, allowing some same day automatic registration and unaffiliated voters to join the party and vote in the party are critical steps to bring more people, particularly young people into the party. If a candidate captures the imagination of someone who has not voted before or was an unaffiliated voter, we should make it easy for that person to join, to vote in the primary and get involved. Uh, Philip, any uh, any questions uh, in the you know, queue? I could just a quick a quick uh, comment on that. I can't say that I disagree with that because it could be a candidate that inspires people to get involved, or an incident that inspires people to get involved. And I will tell you, uh, the Bible stunt last year after those peaceful protesters. That was the day before our primary, and we did see people turn out. Uh, the the numbers did tick up on our primary day. And there's no way we cannot attribute it to that. So I agree um, with that. And I think anything that we can do to make vote voting as accessible and as easy as possible, um, we need to embrace that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Yvette. Uh, uh, Philip, uh, do we have a, uh, someone in the queue? Yes, uh, we have Alexandra Gardo Rooker um, that has her hand raised. So once our staff meets you, um, feel free to ask your question, Alex. Yes, I, I just have a comment that we do have same day registration in California, which, you know, has obviously helped a lot. So I just wanted to mention that we do have that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions no. uh, waiting, Philip? No more questions. Well, you know All what, right. I, Jim, I just wanted to make an observation here. One of the, I think the keys to what Yvette has been doing in Maryland is that she's not waiting. She's not waiting until the elections. Getting ahead of the curve, contacting people early um, so that they are familiar with the party and what you stand for and what you're trying to do is absolutely key because people buy into that much easier than you wait until you know two, three days for the election and you're banging on the door. Uh, like somebody was doing on my door. Um, it is, it, that, that is the key, and that's the key to our success. I, I know here in Texas, we have, uh, our state party did a, a, a survey, and one of the things that the Hispanic community complained about Democrats is that we wait until the last minute to go ring the doorbell or call them on the phone, we never, they never hear from us until it's the day or two before the election. And they're they're not bought into it. And, and it doesn't give us a chance to get our message out. Kudos, Yvette. Well, you know, it's all about relationships. And what we're trying to do is build relationships. You have to build relationships before you ask for something. Yeah. Yeah. So we've decided to build relationships so that when we ask, it will be easier to get to yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Uh, any other questions in the queue, uh, Philip? Nope, all set to move on. Okay, well, thanks again, uh, Yvette. I really appreciate it. Uh, very useful and interesting. We will now hear from the DNC's Director of Voter Protection and Civic Engagement, Raina Walters Morgan. Raina joined the DNC in 2019 as Director of Voter Protection and Civic Engagement and has led the party's efforts on voter protection issues. Raina has worked on voter protection issues at the local, state, and national levels for over two decades. A lawyer by training, Raina will share the uh, vote, voter protection trends she saw during the 2020 cycle and what the DNC is doing to address the recent efforts by Republicans to roll those efforts back. Raina, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Uh, 
we are here to talk about voter protection and how we made it through the primaries. Um, we can, I have a slide deck that I think is about to be loaded possibly. Here we go, perfect. Next slide. Um, so I can tell you it was the longest primary season ever. <laughs> um, because of COVID, we really, my team and many others really worked overtime to ensure that all eligible voters can cast a ballot and have that ballot count. Um, we really noticed about a few, several, about four different things that really made the difference in the primaries. Um, that was um, our decision to build infrastructure early, really to start everything early, um, to focus on our data and technology tools, to put together a coordinated uh, voter protection program for the presidential preference primaries, and then finally reimagining programs uh, due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I said to former Chair uh, Perez when I came in was that we needed to do everything early. And it wasn't necessary, necessarily a novel idea, Anyone in the voter protection space would have told you that because in the past, you've heard me say this before, the trend had been to put staff on the ground, you know, August, September and October uh, before a November election. And that's really just not enough time to do the work that needed to be done. And so we started building the staffing infrastructure early. Uh, the DNC funded many positions in places like uh, positions or uh, programming dollars in places like Alabama, Arizona, Kansas, Kentucky, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, and assisted several other states with fundraising. Um, this was good because what it allowed us to do is get staff on the ground early, to train them early. We conducted over 25 staff trainings uh, in 2020 to get staff prepared for what they would be expected to do in November. Um, and getting them on the ground early gave them the opportunity to have the experience before November, which again, rarely happened previously. Uh, we worked on building a pipeline. One of the other challenges that we had often faced in the voter protection space was not having enough young, talented, diverse people to come in and do this work. And so um, we created a law school boot camp program for voter protection with the with the sole purpose of creating a talent pool for the eventual nominee. Uh, we engaged 172 students from 66 law schools across the country. And although the diversity numbers weren't quite where we wanted them, they were better than what the pool had been previously with 32.5% um, students of color. And the best part of this is that students that, that participated in this program went on to serve the campaign uh, in many ways. Uh, many of them were volunteers doing work on their campuses, but we also had some in prominent roles like regional deputy and even a state voter protection director for, uh, for the state of Washington was an alumni of our boot camp program. Uh, and so that was really critical in terms of building, building the foundation that we knew the eventual uh, nominee would need. Um, we focused on building hotlines. So the interesting thing is we didn't know COVID was going to hit, <laughs> and uh, but we knew the importance of voter assistance hotlines, and we had worked and helped at least thir uh, at least 13 battleground states set up their voter assistance hotlines in advance of the primaries because we wanted those hotlines to be up and running for the primaries. We wanted those numbers to be out before the primary started, and we really wanted um, the, the number to get out there because the more people know about the number, the more likely they are to call. Um, and then the technology tools, you know, that is part of the infrastructure because we made the tools available earlier in the cycle. We can go to the next slide because I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the technology and how important it was to our efforts. So we worked very closely with the data and technology team. Um, and although this discussion is focused on the primary, I do think it's important to give the impact, uh, the context of the impact that these tools had and making them available during the primary had on our overall program throughout the year. So um, the purge tool and tracker, you might remember we launched the voter registration and purge tracker um, in June of 2020. We had a version of this available previously, but it was really difficult to use if you were not a voter file manager or someone who uh, lived in the code. And so 
making this tool available to uh, to parties so that they and staff honestly so that they could run those re-registration programs uh, ahead of the deadlines was critical. Um, the DNC alone texted uh, with with the the uh, collaboration of state parties texted over three hundred and thirty five thousand inactive and active uh, inactive and purged voters uh, before deadlines towards the end of the year. Um, so that's the type of impact that it can have. And you know, again, making making this tool available and really focusing early in the season to make it available was a game changer. I will vote that is our banner uh, tech tool and data source. Uh, this became critically important when we were dealing with the primaries, particularly as we were dealing with COVID. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide, but um, you know, the Iowa Vote has polling place lookups and um, that was a feature that was really, really used uh, and really was helpful in terms of managing, changing uh, circumstances as they related to COVID. Uh, our hotline was critical uh, due to COVID. Without the ability to speak to people in person and face, voters face to face, they really started using um, the hotlines as a way to connect with voters. And as you know, uh, I'm sorry, connect with uh, places to get good information. And as you know, the voter assistance hotline uh, at the DNC is year round. And we definitely saw spikes in participation in the usage of the hotline when COVID hit. Um, and then of course, data tracking. We have um, uh, we have data tools that we use to track incidents. We made those tools available during the primary. It was really, really important for us to make these tools available, to put them in the hands of state parties and staff so that they could learn how to use them so that we could track incidents as they were happening. And most importantly, have that data available so we could fix things before the November election. Next slide, please. This is one of the things that we did uh, that made a lot of sense because we had built that infrastructure and that was to put together a, a presidential preference primary program for voter protection. The goals were really simple to give staff the experience of running a program before November um, to collect data and fix issues before November and to activate voters early in the cycle. Now the challenges um, was were, were a few and some of that included getting people on board who thought voter suppression didn't happen during primaries. Um, we spent a lot of time, and, and I won't, I will say it wasn't the state parties. You know, the state parties that we spoke with were all very excited about doing this program. But sometimes you have people who are, you know, very affiliated and supporters, and we lean on, on them. Um, and I think there was just the the myth that we didn't need to do voter protection during the primary because we didn't have problems. Um, and I think that we all saw during the primary season that that's not necessarily the case. Um, but because we were planning and because COVID hit, um, having those plans and making those decisions to get to build the infrastructure and to really focus on this really was, um, it, it probably saved many of our programs uh, down the line. And then of course the successes, we had participation from um, the majority of presidential campaigns in some way, shape or form. Um, thousands of active uh, volunteers were activated and trained early um, and we were able to identify and reduce some problems ahead of the general election. Um, next slide, please. So COVID was the X factor, to be quite honest. Um, I cannot begin to tell you how much COVID really shook up our world. The world essentially shut down between March 13th and 15th. We had primaries scheduled in Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Ohio on March 17th. Um, I was scheduled to go down to Florida to help them and uh, the, the offices were closed. And so we had to, we were faced with the challenge of converting an in-person operation to a remote operation in a matter of days. But because people were dedicated, because we had people on the ground, we were able to do that. Um, you know, Florida was was one of the most chaotic elections I've ever been a part of for their primary, you know, but volunteers stepped up to the plate. We had volunteers, you know, working to get emergency ballots out to voters who couldn't make it to the polls. Um, we spent the weekend, honestly, bef uh, uh, before the election and the days leading up to the election, trying to get consolidated polling location information. There were locations that were literally closing 
uh, and we didn't know where the closures were and where the new places were going to be. Um, we tried to reach out to the Secretary of State in Florida. Their office was not helpful. <laughs> um, and they essentially told us we needed to call all 67 counties to get this information. So we activated volunteers. We had volunteers combing through uh, county, party, uh, county party websites, uh, county board of elections websites, calling uh, county uh, supervisors of elections to try and figure out where the closures were so that we could let voters know and of course put it on I will vote. That is the key thing about I will vote in 2020. As we were getting information on closures or change locations, we were able to put it on I will vote immediately. Um, and that again was a source for voters. Um, we also had another uh, antidote of like in Illinois, we literally had a campaign staffer in Illinois taking pictures on her phone and sending it to us of where the locations were so that we can get them up, up on I will vote. So um, you know how chaotic it was. But again, the, the point is, is that we really reimagined our programs. Um, we worked to, to reform plans to convert to 100% remote hotline operations. Um, and we fought in court to do what we could to, pr to protect the rights of voters. Um, next slide. I'm not going to focus a lot on this. Um, Wisconsin is a real, but I will say that Wisconsin is a really good example of why having staff on the ground early was critical because we had a voter protection director in Wisconsin. Um, he was able to identify that there were going to be problems that we needed to consider for litigation. So um, I, I believe I'm about at time. So successes, oh, like, Volunteer engagement soared, over 70,000 volunteer shifts. That, that was critical. I will vote over 20 million hits in 2020. We did the work, um, we got people engaged. And then as we're moving forward, we are learning from uh, what worked in 2020. Next slide, please. Um, and we are starting to build that infrastructure now. We are, and sorry, next slide, I'm, a, I'm two slides behind. Um, uh, we're starting to build that infrastructure now um, we are making investments and we are planning uh, to hire in Arizona, uh, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. If you know talented people, send them our way. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you very much, Raina. Uh, lots of great information there. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions or comments from RBC members. If any RBC member would like to be recognized for comments or questions, please use the raise your hand feature in uh, the Zoom. That will help us with the assistance of staff, create a queue that we'll use to call on each member. When it's your turn to speak, you will be announced and unmuted. We will do our best to call on as many members as we can. While we compile the list of RBC members who would like to be called on, I'm going to share a comment from the survey this time from Deirdre in New York. She says, voting must be as user-friendly as possible. More sites, more days, more hours, more mail-in ballots, more legitimate drop boxes, help for the postal service to deliver promptly, automatic registration, same day registration. And if voter ID is mandatory, then all efforts to make that feasible must be enacted. Philip, do we have any questions in the queue? No questions currently. All right. Uh, I th thank you again, Raina. And I think we will now, uh, in the interest of time, uh, move forward uh, to our panel. And I will turn it over to Lorraine Miller. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Raina. You're always so uh, informative. I, I, I hope we come up with some some real, we, we, this voter suppression thing is something that we're really going to have to address and we're going to have to address it early uh, to get ahead of the curve. And I think that's something our um, uh, secretaries of state have emphasized. So good, we're going to move into our primary reforms, the, the caucuses to the primary status. So our final speakers for our meeting today will talk about the states, their state's experience in transitioning from holding a presidential caucus in 2016 
to using a government-run presidential primary for their 2020 process. First, we're gonna hear from the chair of the Washington State Democratic Party, Tina Podolowski. Tina is going to share her thoughts on how Washington State benefited from using the government-run primary this past cycle. After Tina, we will hear from our own fellow beloved RBC member, David McDonald, who will also provide his insights on the primary experience in Washington State and how that improved voter participation. I, um, I will note that uh, our fellow RBC member and ASDC President Ken Martin was planning to join us for this panel to share his experiences, um, but he's feeling a little bit under the weather and not able to join us. So please, let's welcome Tina and David, who will share their thoughts and experiences. Tina, you have the floor. Thank Good you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair Miller, and all of us in Washington State uh, love David McDonald. Let me just start with that piece of it as well, and we're so glad to have him as a member of the RBC. Our process in Washington State to move from a primary to a caucus began in 2017 after a rather chaotic 2016 cycle. In 2016, I was the Secretary of State candidate for the Washington State Democrats, so very keenly aware of how we missed on getting all of our Democratic voters engaged, starting with that caucus process. This was a hard fought change and process that required years of work. We started in 2017 because we had to begin with a legislative change. We needed a legislative majority because in Washington state, we've had a Republican secretary of state for over 56 years. And despite the fact that she's good on some issues, there are other issues where it is not um, uh, advantageous for everyone to be able to vote. Since 2017, we've gone from a one seat minority in the state Senate to a seven seat majority, from a two seat majority in the state house to a 16 seat majority with the most diverse, at least on the democratic side, legislature in the history of Washington state. We were able to supplement the fact that we're an all mail in state with postage paid ballots, automatic voter registration, same day registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, as well as passing the Washington State Voting Rights Act and the Native American Voting Rights Act that removed all barriers, for example, for uh, voters on uh, tribal lands to be able to register using tribal addresses, which are not necessarily a PO box or a street address. Um, we also implemented aggressive use of drop boxes and implementation of drop boxes in all different communities. Um, so to give you a, a sense of the difference, in 2016, we had 3.8 million registered voters in Washington state. The Washington Republican Secretary of State also uh, convened a May non-binding presidential primary, meaning it was not used by either uh, a party. Um, it was sort of a beauty contest in that way and didn't declare any party preference. Remember in Washington state, we don't have uh, party registration. So in 2016, we had our Democratic caucuses. They take enormous time and effort by the party during a time when we really need to be out there and organizing in our communities. We had 230,000 people participate in the caucus, again, against the list of 3.8 million registered voters. In the beauty pageant, non-binding primary, primary, there were 800,000 people who participated. But again, we had no data that we could utilize as a result of that primary because we didn't know if they were Democrats, Republicans, how they were voting to make that happen. By changing the legislation, by having moving from a caucus to a state-run primary, and including in the legislation the fact that folks needed to check a preference box so that we could use the outcome from Democrat if they were a Democrat or a Republican, we had over 1.6 million Democrats participate in the primary. So I want to go back to that difference again, 230,000 in the caucus versus 1.6 million uh, in the primary just four years later. But what was absolutely critical about that was being able to get that list of voters from the Secretary of State that we could then utilize to supplement our own voter databases and begin to start to organize beginning in that primary that 
we also moved up to March. So um, that primary happened the week after Super Tuesday. It was the same day as the Michigan primary. Myself and the incredible uh, Michigan State Party Chair, Lavora Barnes, started to refer to it as Little Tuesday, just to give it some glam. Uh, <laughs> but it was incredibly effective to be able to do that. The other thing that happened by uh, virtue of moving from a caucus to a primary is that candidates showed up. Um, we had uh, 14 of the presidential uh, candidates come into Washington State and be there for our Washington State voters. Um, that was incredible. In fact, we had never had more than one, maybe two candidates ever visit Washington State since 1992, uh, so nearly 40 years uh, in that process. And as a result of having that primary and that rich set of data that we were able to get from the presidential primary coupled with what we ended up doing with our own primary, if you take a look at the turnout rate for our general election in 2020, it was record setting. It was 84.14%. 84 so that was exciting to us uh, in terms of being able to win and win big in a variety of races. So just to give you a sense of how we did this from a process standpoint, we went through a multi-year review process within our own rules and bylaws committee uh, at the Washington State Democrats, and there were competing proposals. There was a proposal for a primary, there was a proposal for a caucus, a modified sort of caucus uh, and primary proposal that we put out there for public comment. We did extensive outreach through our local party organizations and through our organizing networks with a public comment web website. And that went live um, uh, through the month of March, from March 4th, 2019 to April 4th, 2019, uh, to be able to intake and get comments. That website where we had the competing proposals and the uh, all those different versions of what could happen in something like this, there were over, over 100,000 page views of that website. 13,000 people took the time to vote. Uh, for either a primary or a caucus, 93.6% of them were in favor of a primary. And we also got 7,000 additional comments on these different proposals that it were able to make these much stronger. We um, met, pulled those in, and then on Friday, April 5th, uh, the Central Committee, our state Central Committee, met uh, for a, a long meeting uh, outlining the two plans. Um, went through and took a vote on April 7th, and um, we uh, were able to go through and uh, enthusiastically move to a primary process in working through this. So a couple of things I want to say before turning this over to David McDonald. Um, how important it is in a state that does not have uh, party registration to figure out a way to pull in these unaffiliated voters and categorize them in some way. The way that we do this in our ballots is again, you're checking the boxes uh, in making this happen and we're getting that data. So having these people participate, making sure that it's easy for folks to participate, essentially they're making that decision while they're voting um, to make that happen. It's not, they don't have to register months and months in advance. Uh, for a party registration, that is so important. And it uh, allows efforts like ours to be very successful. Having that data access to that voter file is also critical. And in every state that, that does this, I think it's incredibly important, particularly if you don't have uh, party registration. Those presidential visits and campaigning, having that happen in Washington state upped our enthusiasm considerably. So as we think about this entire process, how that gets equally spread through the country, I think is gonna be very, very important. Being able to have an all mail in state and a 21 day voting period for the primary meant that we could have a robust ballot chase and cure period during that 21 day period. And I wanna thank uh, Raina Walters and her team for everything that they do in terms of voter protection. Um, we have employed a very robust ballot chase and cure uh, uh, program since 2018. And this year in the 2020 election, Analyst Institute tracked and analyzed all of our efforts through 2020 and show that the work that we do through this ballot chase and cure program increased the Democratic vote overall by 1.2% across the state of Washington. That may not sound a lot, but when you think about races that we're winning by 51 votes, 110 votes, 830 votes, that makes a dramatic difference to do that now. Finally, 
as Raina mentioned, that inactive and voter and purged voter program. Um, our Washington State Secretary of State has purged over 308,000 voters since 2017 who have not died or have not moved. We are working with uh, each and every one of our 88 different local party organizations, and they are right now in preparation for 2022, working and calling through all those purged voters, all those inactive voters, to get them back on the rolls as Democrats to make this happen. Finally, I just want to give um, just immense thanks and gratitude to Chair Jamie Harrison for his historic investment in our state parties. Flipping those legislative seats, as you know, uh, is critical for redistricting, but also critical to get this legislation passed and to make sure that we're winning secretary of state and county auditor or election official uh, elections all throughout the state to make the process fair. We all know our democracy is under attack and it's an opportunity to make certain that we are not asleep at the wheel in doing this. So let me turn this over to David McDonald. David McDonald, a longtime DNC member, um, a member of our Washington State Central Committee as such, a trusted advisor to all of us in Washington State, and just somebody who has been absolutely incredible on all of these different issues. We are so lucky in Washington to have David. David. Uh, thank you, Tina. I, I'm not sure you're talking about me, but uh, I'll, I'll accept it. Uh, I wanted to, uh, coming at the end of a, a long day of meeting, focus on a couple of things. You know, the RBC made a number of changes to our rules uh, in this last cycle as a result of the Unity Reform Commission, uh, both on the side of uh, emphasizing changes that needed to be made in primary systems and on the side of um, changes that need to be made in the caucus system. Washington was in a unique position by the time we got to this decision. Um, we had been working on improving our caucus system you know, for decades. Uh, when I uh, first started, we had maybe an, an average attendance of four people. Um, by 2016, we were up to 35, 36. Um, we had simplified the forms. We'd done all these things. We had absentee voting was essentially uh, available. Same day registration was essentially available, um, particularly with a chair as technologically sophisticated as uh, Tina. Uh, and her staff, we uh, easily had the technical uh, capability to run caucuses. We probably had the financial capability. So we, we had a choice we could make there. And then at the other side of the uh, spectrum, because of um, the efforts in 2017, the flipping of the legislature, the, the fixing of our basic primary law, not, not our presidential primary law, but just our basic primary law, we had better access on the, the primary and you could begin to say, okay, which, which way do you want to go as a party? You're not necessarily forced to go one way or the other by a, a system. In the past, we had been forced to go to the caucus because the legislature wouldn't give us a primary that was acceptable um, to give us a choice. Now we had a choice. And in uh, listening to the comments today, one of the things that, that uh, maybe is an easy way to suggest it, we've all been in um, and with Zoom meetings for the last um, year and a half. And my experience, I don't know about yours, but um, Zoom meetings are actually pretty good and convenient for five, six, seven, eight people. You know, you don't have to travel. Um, you can get everybody in the same screen. You kind of talk. But when I get into Zoom meetings of three, 400, 500 people, um, it's a, not a very good experience. And that's where we were with our caucuses. Uh, you know, I uh, started, as I said, neighborhood caucus, four people have a conversation, just kind of walk down the street, vote. By 2004, I was in gymnasiums with 1,100 people all talking at once and people standing in lines around the block. Um, and as we continued to increase by 2016, it was getting... Um, worse and the uh, to use a technical term it just doesn't scale you can keep improving it we kept improving the caucus system we focused efforts but it just didn't scale so in that sense um i think parties looking at the long term um, need to consider that particular uh, cost benefit equation the second thing um, that i wanted to, to point out this may be particular to washington because i know some states 
at least my memory uh, from when we were uh, talking about expanding the window in 2007, 2008. Some states use the caucus system for other parts of their um, uh, nominating or election process. They have some ongoing familiarity with it. Washington, uh, both in terms of its presidential primary and in terms of its caucuses, it's a one-time event. Um, nothing else is on the ballot. It's not connected to any other primary. In the case of the presidential cycle, it happens once every four years. Um, and as a result, when it's a purely party-run process, there is a lot of memory loss and institutional loss and retraining and re-recruiting of volunteers that goes on every four years, and you're losing a lot in the process. As we shift to a primary, um, we now have better institutional memory because we're aligned with the same system that is being used for regular elections. The improvements that um, happen that we push through for the regular elections will automatically affect the uh, primary, the staff, uh, uh, all the facilities, our permanent staff. They have memories, they have training manuals, they have training resources that we did not have in the past. And it will scale because government will make sure that primaries in general and elections in general um, scale. We still have to fight the uh, access battles. And finally, uh, related to that, I think the quality improvement cycle becomes a little bit um, easier. In a lot of ways, the caucus system, at least in our state, was a leader in, in some of the improvements. We had same day registration. Washington, when I started, I think it was wait 30 days. Um, we had voting um, uh, when you were uh, not yet of legal voting age, but we wanted to push the voting age down. We had that. We had effectively local um, access. Uh, and, and we added absentee. We, we did these things sometimes before the state uh, did. Now we can focus on improving the primary system as a whole and not just for the presidential um, cycle. And there is a, a, a big benefit there. It goes beyond the, the data. So in, in that sense, I think um, the, the push that the party has been doing with the rules to encourage improvement of caucuses needs to continue um, and where people think it is appropriate to use a caucus, the caucus should continue. But everybody needs to give thought to, to what is the long-term scalability of that system as we continue to improve access. But the other thing I, I would be remiss if I didn't also say, we have to remember that we don't want to totally hand over to a state government that may uh, oftentimes be run by Republicans the ability to simply cancel our nominating process at the last minute by refusing to fund it, um, or to uh, add restrictions um, that become exclusionary, and we have no fallback system. So somehow or another, we have to address that uh, issue going forward. But those were my reactions to the to the process. It was a, a great success in um, Washington um, with the cooperation of the legislature, um, some forward thinking. Oh, and that finally, I'm, Apologize. The one thing that, that you may not notice, but I noticed, is was a big benefit of the change, is the absence of all the negative messaging that would happen every cycle as the press and everybody complained about the caucuses, complained about standing in line, complained about there weren't enough volunteers. To the extent they complained this time, they largely complained about the government, but they were not interfering with the democratic message that we were trying to get out. And that is a big benefit. Um, with that, uh, if I haven't run over my time, I will yield any of it back. Thank you. You're muted, Maureen. Th thanks. Oh, I'm muted. I'm just chatting along here and nobody's hearing it, which may be a good thing. So thank you both for um, your comments, your insight. I think that's what's so valuable to our committee is your personal insights, you lived it, you breathed it, you did it. And so that brings the reality of what we are going to, to do as a committee to uh, craft our rules, um, that, that's great insight. I wanted to, um, as a post note, Raina's presentation will be available um, our party affairs office will send it out to all the RBC members so that you can have it. Cause that's this voter suppression, what we're doing from um, 
coming from um, all of our uh, the primaries to the caucuses. This is important stuff that we're going to have to to uh, look at. And and um, you're absolutely right, David. We're going to have to have some alternatives because if these legislatures flip or have a significant influence one way or the other that that's not to our advantage, we've got to be able to um, function. So thank you, um, Tina and David, for your great presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions and, and comments by um, RBC members. Remember again, if, if you want to be recognized for any comments or questions, uh, use the raise your hand feature in the Zoom, and that'll help the staff get um, get a get a setup for the queue. Um, when it's your turn to speak, you will be announced, and we'll be do our darndest to uh, recognize you in the sequence that you've been uh, uh, that you've asked for. So, Philip, do we have? I think we have Ms. Brazil. Yes, feel free. Um, we will unmute your microphone um, uh, and feel free to ask your question. There we go. Well, first of all, thank you all. This has been a very important meeting. I know we got a lot more to go through over the next couple of months. Uh, David and Tina, I know back in 2019, Washington State, like many other states, uh, was greatly concerned about hacking attempts. Your Secretary of State addressed it. Uh, did you all hear of or experience any type of threats, uh, um, either overt or covert threats to your election system this time? No, um, uh, we worked uh, very hard in 2019 to look at all of those issues from a technical standpoint. If, if To take you back into history too, Donna, when I ran in uh, 2016 uh, for Secretary of State, uh, our, we actually hacked into the Secretary of State's database to show her the technical <laughs> you when you have a computer engineer for a state party chair. So we actually <laughs> the database to show the vulnerabilities and that made a significant change um, in the work that was done around the vulnerability issues. I think that that was something we were particularly worried about with diverse voters, uh, voters of color and um, what we saw in terms of particular surnames, for example, Hispanic surnames that were um, particularly vulnerable. But in this cycle, what we saw was overall in Washington state, Native American voters up 14%, Asian Pacific Islander voters up uh, 12%, uh, both Latinx and um, African American voters up uh, 10%. So that was something that we were incredibly excited about to see. And we were tracking very clearly because we did have that data. Thank you. I didn't know you were a hacker. I could have used it. <laughs> uh, let, me ask, uh, let me also ask the, the panel, if not the panel, uh, if if my good friend, uh, our legal counsel is on the phone, the Supreme Court is about to rule on some important voting rights cases that could basically shred what is left of the Voting Rights Act, unless Congress moved to pass HR1 for the People Act. Do anyone know the status of uh, what, if any, steps we will take if the Supreme Court rules against us uh, and some of the most aggressive, I think, uh, voter suppression laws out yeah. there? Graham? Oh, oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that we are all um, sort of waiting to see what the outcome is going to be. And to be very honest, that is why being proactive on the voter protection space and like getting staff on the ground early, mobilizing volunteers, educating voters, that's, in my opinion, part of the reason why we need to be so vigilant about building that infrastructure early. Um, because to be very honest, the courts have not always been very favorable, especially in the last few years um, towards some of our efforts. And so regardless of where the court comes down uh, on, on section two, we need to be prepared and we need to plan 
to educate voters and work with uh, voters regardless of that. And that is what we are trying to do in terms of being proactive and building the infrastructure and getting the volunteers mobilized and, and planning early. Um, e either way, it's going. It, e either way, we're going to have a lot of work to do. And and the other thing I'll say is that the good thing is that we are not alone in this space. Um, we do a lot of work, definitely, but we do work and collaborate with a lot of different organizations that are very heavily invested and involved. Um, particularly sister committees, groups like DAS, groups like, um, you know, the DS and the DTRIP. Uh, we've had many lawsuits with them in the past. Um, so I think we will continue to be aggressive and really focus on litigating when necessary. But to be honest, we've got we've got to do the, the proactive work and being successful on the proactive efforts, I think, is where we're going to be able to see the needle move. And my last question, Jim and Lorraine, I know we're going to get to this at some point, but rank choice voting, uh, when sure. some of the systems uh, transition from caucus to state run primaries, and we know we did have a number of states that did uh, yeah. experiment with rank choice voting. So I would be interested in hearing about that in the future. With that, I'll turn back my time. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Donna. And, and Jim is kind of our a uh, resident expert on ranked choice voting. Um, Jim, did you want to comment on that? We're, we're going we're gonna to address it, but go ahead, Jim, if you want to comment. So I live in a city that has used ranked choice voting since 1940. Uh, uh, so a lot of familiarity with that. Uh, and uh, as we know, there's a number of states and other cities, including New York City and its upcoming yeah. Yeah. primary that are going to be using ranked choice voting. That will be a topic in one of our future meetings. That's right. Lorraine if, uh, and Jim, if I could um, also say, when you compare the caucus to the primary, the one benefit of a caucus that we have not successfully translated to a primary is the ability of someone whose candidate has not qualified for the 15% threshold to realign and join forces with other yes. people and, mm -hmm. uh, and bring their issues forward. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever motivated them to come out to the caucus can, goes forward in the caucus system potentially just simply because they realign. Whereas in the primary system as we presently implement it, we simply flush that part yep. of the electorate out of the system on the theory mm -hmm. that we will regain them someplace down the road because our candidate will be so charismatic or, or whatever, but we don't keep the issue involvement. Um, and rank choice voting is a potential way, at least for the 15%, the, uh, uh, the, the votes that have not met 15% to be redistributed. Now, whether it's workable in a, in a government system remains to be seen, but it's certainly something that I hope um, we explore because that's a pretty, you know, when we talked last summer or two summers ago, I guess it was, when you were looking at the early polling for the first upfront states, if you said, okay, let's eliminate at each stage the people who don't have 15% in the polls, by the time you got to South Carolina, half of the people who participated would have been flushed out of the system and potentially had no reason to pay attention to the election, you know, for the next eight months. And that's in close elections a pretty big giveaway um, to, to give up. So yeah. David, I'll just comment that I'm sure it's technologically feasible. Uh, how it works politically, we'll learn more as we see experiments like the New York City yeah. election. Uh, in our city, uh, we elect nine city councilors all on the same ballot using uh, uh, using ranked choice voting. Uh, so it's it te the technology can be worked out. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that we necessarily need it for figuring out the nominee in the sense that we're already using what amounts to proportional representation and redistribution. It's just that 15% segment that gives me some, some pause, particularly in multi-candidate fields, as we looked at last uh, cycle. If you're getting 9, 10, 12 candidates, that percentage gets to be pretty daunting, potentially yeah. you get winner take all situations that you don't anticipate. Yeah. Well, committee, just rest assured, ranked choice voting is on the radar screen and we will be discussing it. So again, um, there's 
Uh, Philip, there's one other person I see with a raised hand. Yeah, it's just time for one last question. Uh, Harold, he's, uh, we'll unmute your microphone um, and feel free to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you for the presentations. Tina, I just want to re reconfirm that I heard correctly and then ask you a question. You, as I under, my notes show there were 230,000 participants in the Democratic caucuses, presidential caucuses in 2016 compared to 1.6 million who participated in the Democratic presidential primaries in 220. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Two questions. One is, do you have any sense of what the relative costs of running the caucuses compared to the relative costs of running the primaries? I assume that the, the, the funding sources are different but I didn't know whether it would be interesting to know if there's any data on costs. And then the second question is on the caucuses, were they similar to uh, what I think I know about the Iowa caucuses? That is they're all on one day, they all are a specific set of hours uh, that, that the caucuses can participate. And if so, what were those hours? Yes, um, they are all, uh, to, to give you a sense, uh, in 2016 uh, about the caucuses themselves, they were all on one day. They were all a set of hours. In general, I would say the hours were long. Um, <laughs> most of these caucuses ended up sort of starting at a 9 a.m. and many of them went for 10 or 12 hours. So individuals uh, with kids, folks who are shift workers, uh, folks with disabilities, uh, people who did not want to spend 12 hours in uh, a gym somewhere uh, in Tacoma, Washington, um, either left or did not participate in any way to make that happen. Um, the cost, uh, and I can get you the cost information for the committee, is what we would have looked at for a 2020 primary versus a 2020 caucus. But I can tell you that the, it would have been significant hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for the party to be able to work this correctly um, as a caucus to comply with all of the different rules and the security to make this happen. Our, that, was, that was huge for us as opposed to a state run primary, um, which essentially uh, did not cost us uh, in any way, shape or form near something like that to be able to participate in. It's so clear that this would have, in many ways, um, taken the party's attention, meaning my staff, which is small, um, uh, for months, and then also uh, our ability to then participate and work our coordinated campaign post the presidential primary would have been severely impacted just from a, from a resource standpoint by something like this. Uh, Harold, if I can add a couple of things. Um, in 2016, we had... Um, the equivalent of absentee ballots, at least were um, necessary and known in advance. We did not have last minute uh, requests for absentee ballots or all the benefits of mailing. But uh, second, one of the distinctions um, that would have, have disappeared in any event, uh, the long delays, a 12 hour caucus in 2016 was most likely a second tier or third tier caucus where um, it wasn't the, the first day presidential or precinct caucus where you were signing in and electing delegates to the next level. It was the next level where you were getting the delegates there, six weeks had passed or whatever. If there were arguments over rules, you were right on the boundary lines. Because of the lock-in rule that the uh, RBC passed, locking in the allocations at first preference, my guess is that the second and third tier caucuses would have been simpler but um, the cost question is exactly what tina said you know we can give you an abstract cost figure of running the caucuses if you assume we don't have to comply with a lot of the new rules of the dnc <laughs> um, you know but if you're talking about a compliant caucus and you're talking about the problems of testing software which anybody who, who works in the software industry knows is actually a bigger potential problem than hacking is simply buggy software feature feature creep and those things, it becomes a very expensive proposition. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David and Tina, again, for your expertise. So committee members, we've, we're, about, we're about to wrap up. So on the primary reforms, we've discussed 
changes that led to increased participation. Then we talked a good bit about voter protection trends. And then we've ending our uh, discussion this afternoon with caucus and primary uh, states. So Jim, will you wrap us up? Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, uh, members, we've come to the end of our agenda for today. I want to thank you each and every one uh, again for all the time and attention you've given to this very important process. We obviously could not do uh, the work without every one of you. We'll be back in touch with you when we have more information to share about our next meeting. I can say that we are looking to schedule the meeting sometime in July. So if you have any known conflicts, please let our team know so that we can try to pick a date that works for most members. As we mentioned earlier, our next meeting will focus on the reforms that were made to the caucus process for 2020 and to the way automatic delegates participated in our nominating process. In the meantime, please stay in touch with us <clears throat> and let us know if you have any additional thoughts or ideas on the topics we are discussing. Also, everyone, please stay healthy. If you haven't gotten vaccinated, do so right away. We hope to see you all again in person very soon. The chair will now entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Thank you. Got a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you and have a great Memorial Day weekend.